I'm Catherine Arndt, the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. Welcome to today's episode, brought to you by the VLGA, your councillor support network and the national broadcaster on all things local government. Hello and welcome to VLGA Connect. I'm Chris Eddy and we've got a special edition for you today. I'm going to spend some time getting to know the new VEC Commissioner in Victoria. Sven Blumel is joining me. Hello Sven, nice to meet you. Hello Chris, nice to meet you too. Great to have you here on VLGA Connect at what I imagine is a busy time for you. You're three months into the role. How are you settling in? Oh, look, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, just to be at that at that centre of the, the the process of our democracy, it's, it's just a wonderful privilege. But it's also been extremely busy since I started in August. So it, uh, it's been a bit unrelenting, but um, it's so interesting that that more than makes up for it. Excellent. So um, can we talk a bit about your career journey to this role? Where have you come from to ultimately be the Victorian Electoral Commissioner? Well, immediately before the current role, I was the Victorian Information Commissioner. And some of the people watching this might well be uh, familiar with that role and indeed may have dealt with me or my previous colleagues in that role. So as Victorian Information Commissioner, I was the statutory independent arbiter and regulator of information in terms of freedom of information, information privacy, and information security across uh, state and to a large extent, local government in Victoria as well. Uh, before that, I did a similar role in Western Australia, a smaller scale. Um, and before that, some roles in, in executive government in Western Australia and the Commonwealth. Uh, and also, uh, I practiced uh, law in the private sector in Melbourne. So how do you go from being a lawyer, and I've heard you describe yourself as a reformed lawyer, how do you go from being a lawyer to these sort of public uh, s sector roles? Yeah, look, no offence to any uh, uh, any lawyers that are watching this, um, but yes, I do call myself a reformed lawyer sometimes because it's been so long since I've actually practised uh, and I can't see myself going back anytime soon, although I had a great time practising. Uh, the, the, the way I found my, my way there, I think it probably goes back to when I was studying in Canberra uh, or in the... 80s and, and early 90s, when I had a, a very inspiring lecturer in the area of administrative law, which is something that until that point I've not even heard of. And it's basically, it, it sounds boring on one level, but administrative law is, is really the law of, of government power um, and our, our democracy. And when you think about it, I think that's, that's wonderful. So even though I learned it at, at that time and, and found it fascinating, it was actually many years after that that that, that was sort of rekindled and I thought, I like this sort of space. And then as opportunities developed in that space, I uh, uh, I took them uh, and in those cases where I was successful, ultimately built on them and, and, and now I'm here and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted. So in your most recent role as the Victorian Information Commissioner, can you just talk a bit more about how that role intersected with local government? Yeah, sure. So in terms of freedom of information and information privacy, uh, that applies to state and local government in Victoria. Uh, in that regard, I was, say, in the FOI space, um, providing a, a training function for agencies, but then also being the, the independent arbiter, ultimately, of FOI disputes under the Act. Uh, in information privacy, somewhat different. Uh, there, there was no real formal determination powers that I had, but, but again, we tried to improve the quality of information privacy practice across state and certainly local government in Victoria. And then when there was a dispute in that case, we would try and resolve it by agreement. Where it got a bit complicated in terms of local government jurisdiction was in the information privacy, sorry, the information security space, which is what the legislation, the Privacy and Data Protection Act actually calls data protection little bit confusingly, but it, it talks about information security. And local councils as a whole are not included in that part of the Act, but to the extent that councils run committees of management, which of course just about all of them do, those operations are covered by the information security side of things. So it got a bit complex um, and we helped uh, local councils get through that as, as best as we could. 
So uh, just before we get to your current role and what's ahead, because uh, it, it, it is a big time ahead for council elections uh, particularly, what observations are you able to share with us about how councils have responded to freedom of information in particular? You say you were the, you know, the ultimate arbiter of disputes. How, how, how many of those uh, was uh, local government bringing to your mm. table in terms of um, proportion? Look, in terms of proportion, I would actually have to say that in a lot of ways, local government got less of an FOI workload than state government. And I think, at least in part, there's a, a good and positive reason behind that. And that is that in a lot of ways, local councils are actually, I think, quite good at proactively disclosing information. Um, and I think that might be in part because of the closeness to your community and the fact that people have very direct dealings with their local council. And so therefore local councils on average are pretty good at pushing out information. Here's what you as the, the resident need to know about this process. Here's how you can lodge an application for this in a good way. So there's a lot of pushing information out proactively, which as information commissioner, that was, that was music to my ears because um, the more of that you do, the less you actually have to respond to the Air Force. Um, now, once there was a dispute, I think the, the kind of arguments between uh, applicants and local council were broadly similar to the kinds that you get in state government as well, um, albeit in a different context. So yeah, that's, that's, that's the overall picture, I'd say. Interesting. Th thank you for that. So let's get to uh, current uh, um, issues of, of interest. And obviously, we're less than 12 months out from a council election or round of council elections. The last one, of course, was conducted in a COVID environment. Uh, aside from the obvious, what can we expect will be different, do you think, this time around, Sven? The really big change is the um, enrolment process for uh, people who are entitled to vote by virtue of being on the what we call the CEO list. Um, so these are where you have uh, residents who are on the VEC state electoral roll and they are resident at that address in the local council. Pretty straightforward. We do what we've always done. They're on the state roll uh, and, and that's how they get on the roll for the particular local government election, no problem. Where you have someone who has an entitlement to vote not as a resident there, um, the absentee uh, landlords are in some businesses, etc. What will change for next year is that they need to apply to the local council to get on the list for that election. That's a big change. We've been working with local council ex extensively and will continue to do that but it will still be a big change and I'm sure that, that we'll see some complexity arising from that. So that sounds like there's an administrative process that councils need to pick up on for the first time and uh, you're working with councils to make sure they understand their obligations in that regard? That's correct. And, and we're actually in some ways quite hands-on um, about that so that councils not only understand, but we, we help them to do that. Um, those sort of things are set up in our, uh, our comprehensive service plan but that's a big change and, and, and we're, we're here, we're already assisting and we'll continue to do that to make sure that the local councils do what they need to be able to do. Sven, what's the trigger for these changes? Are these things that have come in in the, the Local Government Act 2020 or is there some other mechanism that's brought this about? It was the change in 2020. It, it brought in several changes, including that one, as well as, of course, the, the move to um, single council awards across uh, a larger number of councils than before. Um, that's another big change that, that we're seeing. Uh, but yes, they all came out of the 2020. So you, you mentioned the single member wards. We know some of those are coming in. We know there's electoral structures that are yet to be finalised that will likely have similar outcomes. What is the impact of those structural changes on how you prepare for and run council elections? Yeah, they're pretty substantial. Um, as you can imagine, moving to single council awards, effectively every ward is its own election. Um, and in our case, we're almost almost doubling the number of elections we have to do next year compared to, to four years earlier. Uh, I mean, we're, we're going to be running concurrent elections for, for in the order of 400 wards. Um, that's a big change for us. Yes, we're, we're working on that, but it, it is a substantial change. And number of candidates, my to, to my eye last time around, particularly in some metro councils, the number of candidates seemed to be substantially more 
than in previous elections. Is that true? And do you see that as a trend that is likely to continue? Uh, yes and yes. Um, it, it is a trend and uh, we're likely to see it continue. But it is, of course, a spectrum. You, you, you did quite rightly mention there mainly metro councils uh, in uh, interface councils, but then also more particularly regional areas. Um, you can have the risk of the opposite. If, if, you're, if you're having single council awards, you may end up with a situation where you either have a very small number or, or indeed no candidate. Now, obviously, we're hoping that that will not be the case, um, but that's, of course, beyond our control. So, uh, But we are preparing for, for both ends of that spectrum and indeed. So CEOs watching and listening to this are probably uh, thinking about how they prepare for the costs of running these elections with the cost of living crisis and inflation. Uh, are they likely to expect significantly increased costs this time around? It will vary from council to council, but... Unfortunately, the short answer is yes. Um, uh, based on our projections, we expect that on average there will be substantial increases. That includes both increases in postage, as I've already mentioned. That's that's a that's a really big one. Um, we haven't got the quantum of that yet. We're working, as I said, uh, on refining that as much as we possibly can. Um, we're also centralising uh, certain uh, services as part of the election. We're, uh, we're centralizing phone services so that we can take uh, inquiries, complaints, all of those sorts of things. We're also centralizing the, um, uh, the issue of replacement votes. So based on the feedback that we heard from the last local government elections, there, there's a strong desire for those sorts of services and, and, and we are happy to provide them. And we can see the, the efficiencies that can be done, but it does mean that that will be a part of the cost that we have to pass on to councils obviously on the understanding that some of those services will actually result in other savings for the local government. But there's no sugarcoating it. it. It will, on average, be an increase in costs. And, and we're doing whatever we can to, to, to reduce costs wherever we can. The other thing we're doing is we're providing a, a range of opt-in services for local councils. Again, we understand that, that you need to um, manage your costs. We're actually about to send out um, some estimates uh, very shortly that, that will be in December. Uh, and early December, uh, ideally, and that is intended to allow you to do your budget um, the process, which I know most, if not all of you, are, are well and truly into uh, already. So where we can make uh, services optional, that will give you the ability to say, well, yes, we need that at this cost, or no, we don't need that. We have a, a more efficient way, we think, of doing, doing that, and that will be able to You've effectively answered my next question is around timing, because most councils uh, would be already thinking about their budget for next year. And of course, they get into that pretty heavily around February, March. So they'll have some indications on what to allow for by that time. Uh, that's great. So um, we're actually going to have the estimates out in, we're aiming for early December. They're, they're well progressed. Um, they will be detailed. Um, there will be estimates only at this stage. As I've mentioned, there's a couple of things that we haven't uh, landed on a, a full figure yet. But in those cases, we're, we're giving our best indication that we can. And then there will be the formal quotes in around um, April, May next year. So Sven, uh, it was great to hear you address the VLGA's annual general meeting only a week or so ago. And I heard you talk about some of the challenges uh, that you are expecting to have to deal with in delivering these elections. We talked about some of them, costs, the structural reviews, entitlements, et cetera. One that you talked about was the impact of social media. And I hadn't thought about how that might impact on, on you and how you prepare. You talked about this concept of pre-bunking. Can, can you tell me what that's all about? Yeah, sure. This all goes to mis and disinformation. And, um, a well-established response to that is the, the debunking of myths. And of course, we, we already do that. We will continue to do that and we'll be doing that heavily during local government election campaigning period next year. The concept of pre-bunking is based on the idea that by the time a myth has already started to take some hold on, it doesn't have to be social media, but that's usually where it, where it is or where it starts and where it's spread. Um, it's actually then quite hard to shift people's perspective, even when you provide them with thoroughly reviewable and scrutinized, reliable data that proves it is a myth. Um, Pre-bunking is all about actually saying to people, look, there's an election coming up. You will be seeing myths and disinformation. It is likely to be along these sorts of lines. 
here's the kind of critical thinking that you can apply to strengthen your defenses to it. And here is where you can go for the facts. That's sort of the, the, the concept of pre-bunking. And we're certainly factoring that into our planning for next year. It's a very proactive approach by the sounds of it. Is that a departure from the way the VUC has prepared for elections in the past? Uh, look, it, it's probably an evolution, I'd say. Um, uh, it's not a revolution. It's not a... We, we've been doing this sort of stuff for, for quite some time now. Um, and this is just a, a sort of a, an, an improvement about how we can be more effective in that space. Uh, we're already very quick about responding to mis and disinformation as soon as we become aware of it. Um, but uh, even this pre-bunking, as I said, and, and similar kinds of proactive things, we're just giving more effort to those than ever because uh, it's necessary, sadly, for us to do that. Before we get off next year's elections, I believe you've been out and about talking to council CEOs and others about preparing for next year's elections. Can you t tell us a bit more about the consultation that you're doing with the sector? So um, I and, and uh, some of my colleagues here um, have been talking to the CEOs of uh, several councils, many, and in fact, uh, I think by now, probably most councils. And before we're done, um, before Christmas, we will have spoken to all of them. Uh, the idea there is that, that we contact them at that most senior level from our most senior level, and we just sort of do a bit of a, um, a, bit of a check on how things are going, um, what are the main concerns that, that we have? What are the things that we'd like councils to be aware of in their preparation? And we're going to do that again in six months' time as a, as a bit of a checkup. You know, uh, here's how we thought things would go. Um, have they been going that way? Is there something that the VEC uh, needs to provide that we didn't think of six months ago? Uh, and so on. Now, should stress, of course, that at the same time, that there will be continuous uh, communication between council staff and VEC staff in the planning process. That, that will continue as always. But we're just doing these CEO level check-ins um, uh, on a couple of occasions, just to make sure that, that we're there, we're seen, we can answer questions and we can provide the clarity about the challenges that we see. And you're no doubt thinking about the people you need to employ to run uh, the 400 elections that you've, you, you've told us about. Do postal elections have less of a call on human resources for you or more than attendance? Uh, different. Um, and look, I, I'd probably say in some ways in terms of pure staffing, it, it would be less than, say, a, a, a general a state attendance election. Mm. Um, but there are different challenges as well. Um, one of the issues, of course, with postal um, uh, voting is that not only does it have to be secure, but it has to be seen to be secure. Um, of course, we're doing lots of things in that space to make sure that is the case. Um, but there is also the issue of accessibility, for example. For some people, a, a postal ballot system is actually very positive um, in terms of their ability to access and, and discharge their, their um, uh, democratic uh, duty and, and, and um, uh, participate effectively. But for some people, uh, it's actually less accessible. Um, because, for example, people with, um, uh, with vision uh, difficulties and so on. Uh, all of those things are, uh, we're factoring into our process, of course. Um, but even though on one level, it seems these sorts of things, some things are more straightforward or, or require less resources. There are other things that then come up and require uh, more careful thought to make sure we don't disenfranchise anyone. So it's it's across the board, and some are up, some are down in terms of the the, the effort that we have. And when do you expect to have all your staff in place ahead of October's elections? Oh, look, it'll be in the middle of next year. Um, we have a a, a pool of, of very very experienced um, staff that we can uh, that we can call on for uh, ensuring that we get fully trained election managers, um, uh, assistant election managers and so on, and that'll be in place in the middle. And, and we'll make sure also that we um, uh, work with councils to make sure that they're introduced to their uh, staff. We will have a, um, a central liaison person for each council uh, so that they have one person to deal with at the VEC as well to make sure we've got that relationship. So uh, before we let you go, Sven, I'm, I'm really keen to, to dig into some data with you if, if you've got it handy. I've been keeping track of the extraordinary vacancies this term of council and from, from the outset to this week with the presumed resignation that's coming of Eden Foster at Greater Dandenong, I make it at about 56 for the term, three years in. I'm really keen to know how that 
compares to previous years? It feels like a lot. Uh, yes, look, it is it is a lot, but it's actually not that much bigger than previous years. Now we we can't we've got to compare apples and apples, but if mm. if we look at say the the current period since the 2020 local government elections, there have been well 56 or, or 58 if you add in a sort of two uh, failed or completed elections from the general election back in 2020. So that's 56 right. or 58, depending mm. on on how you count. Um, in the previous four year period from 2016 to 2020. There were 53. So it is an increase, but it's actually not a huge increase. Um, it's, uh, well, what's that? It's about 5%. Now, the, um, what does happen, though, in, in both of those periods is that in sort of the, the second last and last years of the term before the next election, that's when the numbers go up. Now, that's probably not surprising, given that it's sort of towards the end of the term and more things have come up that, that may lead to um, the need for a countback or a by-election. So just to give you an idea, in, in the, uh, 2016, we had one, 2017, we had nine. Then 2018, the third year, 14, and the next year, 21. In the current four-year period, we're tracking similarly. So we had two, eight, 18, 24. Uh, and there's a few on, obviously, at the moment. And you've already yeah. mentioned uh, Dandenong, which uh, is an expected vacancy. So um, the, the overall picture is, yeah, look, maybe a 10% increase. Um, but what I think will have a much bigger impact going forward is single council awards. Because when someone resigns from a single council award position, we can't do a countback. We have to do a by-election. And the number of single council awards will increase, as I've already mentioned, substantially. So therefore, uh, the number of by-elections is likely to increase substantially over the next four-year period. One of the things we're, we're, um, we're currently planning is to say, well, how can we do that efficiently so that we're, you know, can we group together um, uh, and make certain uh, dates throughout the year as sort of designated uh, by-election uh, weekends or, or periods? Um, so that we can get some uh, efficiency to scale for us and ultimately, of course, for councils. So we're currently working on that because we know it's going to happen. And that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought about that, the, that being an impact of single member wards. So council CEOs should probably be thinking about ensuring that their longer term financial plans factor in something to account for that rather than it coming out of left field and surprising them. It is a difficult thing to do. I mean, conceptually, yes, certainly being aware of this risk, I think, is is, is vital, and, and and we're raising that awareness where we can. In terms of budgeting for it, that that is quite tricky for a couple of reasons. One, of course, it is completely outside the the, the council's control, the, the the budget process as such. Um, and second, uh, looking at those those figures we just talked about, um, the demand is likely to to not be uniform across the four years. Yeah. So, um, and uh, th that makes quite the challenge for budgeting purposes. So conceptually, yes, absolutely. Um, in terms of the practicalities of that, that, that could be quite tricky. Yeah, it's quite lumpy, isn't it? And there'll be, there'll be a number of councils that won't be impacted at all and haven't been impacted this, this term and others that are disproportionately affected with, uh, with a whole heap of vacancies, as the minister has mentioned, in terms of the reforms that are, that are coming. So, uh, yeah, uh, not an exact science, is it? It's not an exact science, but it is a science, I think, yeah. to a large extent. Um, yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're getting more and more data informed. Uh, we're making sure that all the decisions we make in terms of planning um, and executing are evidence-based. But we're also keen to make sure that they're based on the feedback we hear from last time. And that's something that we've very much done from 2020 to now for next year's election, is to make sure that we've taken into account all of the feedback we've received, including, most importantly, from local governments themselves. That's been really interesting to hear about all that planning that's going in for next year's elections. I'd love to check in with you at some future point in time to see how things are going. And by the sounds of things, if a council CEO hasn't heard from you yet, they're about to, and uh, you'll keep that dialogue going through next year. Certainly will. Sven, thank you for your time. Great to meet you and all the best for the work that's ahead. And I hope you get a chance to take some uh, some time to reflect and, and rest over Christmas, New Year. Well, I hope you do too, and I'm looking forward to it. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you, Sven Blumel, the VEC Commissioner, our guest today on VLGA Connect.